Hello, and welcome to Community Connections, a program dedicated to those individuals living with a developmental or physical challenge. I'm Andrea Thronson, Community Connections developer. Today, we are incredibly honored to have a real celebrity on our program. Dr. Temple Grandin is a professor of animal sciences at Colorado State University in Fort Collins, Colorado. She's authored several books, tours the country extensively, and is a genuine pioneer in the field of disability awareness. Our biggest welcome, Dr. Grandin. Thank you for having me here. Absolutely. So tonight we want to be talking about success and working in the world. Um, you know, this population of people has so many gifts and so many talents. And I want to talk a little bit about how do we go from just surviving to really thriving. So let's talk, let's start at the beginning. And could you talk about, you know, you have got such an innate work ethic and such a passion. Tell me how you started. What's your background? Well, when I was a little kid, I had no speech until I was four years old. You know, severe autism. Got into really good early intervention. Now, the problem you got with autism is that it goes from, and I went to the computer museum today, and I saw lots of people on the mild end of the autism spectrum there. How about the Cray supercomputer guy? Probably was one of them. Mm -hmm. And at the other end of the spectrum, you've got somebody who can't dress themselves. It's all called the same thing. Now, individuals on the autism spectrum often have an area of strength and an area of disability. Build on the strength. I was really good at art. My ability in art was always encouraged. And that helped me with my livestock design business. Because in industrial design, you've got the art side. Let's take the iPhone, for example. Steve Jobs was an artist, designed the interface. The mathematicians and the programmers and the engineers had to make the inside of that phone work. So art was always encouraged. Another thing is work ethic. When mm -hmm. I was 13 years old, um, my mother got me a little sewing job with a neighborhood seamstress. At 15, I was cleaning horse stalls. I Also, at 16, I was out at my aunt's ranch, and she had a guest ranch, and I took guests on rides. I also had to wait on a few tables out there, too. I was painting signs and selling them. I was doing internships in college, such as working at a research lab. Work ethic was learned. I also get asked how to get interested in the cattle industry exactly. because I was an Easterner. It was at my aunt's ranch when I went out there, first went out there when I was 15 years old. So what are some of the things that help someone to be successful? Work ethic. Also, kids need to get exposed to things at an early age. I, I was uh, looking at some of the stuff again at the computer uh, museum and uh, early exposure to electronics. That definitely was a key. It's almost too late at college. They need to be exposed sooner. And the other big thing is teaching kids how to work. Teaching. So that, that's really an interesting topic because I think in today's society where we've got cell phones and iPods and, uh, you know, 24-7 where everything's instant gratification, we've lost a little bit of the genuine work ethic, just the get up, go to work, earn a good living. How would you um, advocate that we bring that back in kids? Chores for real little kids, and uh, this is a straight 50s thing. Also, back in the 50s, kids were taught manners in a much more systematic way. Uh, in middle school, we need to make paper route substitutes. I know the paper routes are gone, but how about walking dogs for the neighbors? If you belong to a community group or a church, a volunteer job there, they've got to learn how to do a task outside the home on a schedule. The instant they're 16, they need to go into the workforce. Because the big problem I'm seeing is they got, oh, little Tommy's got autism. We'll go up and order his food for him. I'm going, no, he needs to go up to that counter and order his own food. I'm seeing problems, especially on fully verbal in individuals, too much coddling, where they're not learning basic things like grocery shopping. Uh, there's a lot of moms have trouble with letting go. I remember one conversation I had with a family. They had a 15-year-old son, fully verbal, really good at video editing. And their church had some video that needed to be edited. And I suggested that he do it in the church office because I wanted to get him out of the house 
doing something for somebody else. And mom got really upset and said she couldn't let go. But if you don't get them out learning how to work, I'm seeing them ending up as video game addict addicts on a social security check. And then right. I go to the computer history museum and I've been to Google, I've been to Microsoft and other places like that. And I'm seeing people there I know are on the spectrum. And then I go to an autism meeting and I see the same kind of kid and he's addicted to video games and he ends up on social security. They're the same kid. Same kid, and you're exactly right on because it's where that child, that person has put their energy. Did they fuel it into something like a job and work that's productive, or are they fueling it into a video game? Well, then they're not getting good jobs in the video game industry. I've followed a lot of these. They're having lousy outcomes. Mm -hmm. And things like programming need to be introduced early. We've got to get kids exposed to interesting things early. I, I got interested in cattle because I was exposed in high school. And when I went and visited Fermilab, I talked to a lot of scientists, especially some of the women scientists, and I was boy, happy to see all the women that started computing at the computer museum. Um, the women scientists told me that they got involved in physics because a high school science teacher got them turned on. Mm -hmm. exactly. High school science teacher. Community college is almost too late. We've got to be getting them exposed a lot sooner than that. Another big area where we have a gigantic shortage of people is skilled trades. Mm -hmm. um, I've designed a piece of equipment called a center track restrainer system for beef cattle. If you want to see how it works, you can look at Beef Plant Video Tour with Temple Grandin. Mm -hmm. I worked with major companies on installing this equipment all through the 90s. Worked with a lot of extremely talented millwrights. And don't right. stick your nose up at skilled trades. The, building these big plants, this was really complicated stuff. There's a ton of jobs in mechanics. Mm -hmm. There's a video they played this morning on United Airlines, a tour of their maintenance hangar. They had the covers off of the most advanced jets. This is complicated stuff. All these mechanical places are hiring right now. Right. And where are the guys that ought to be fixing that airplane or fixing that truck? They're playing video games. Exactly. Or they're not working at Google, which right. is something they should be doing. So, Dr. Grandin, how would you, as service providers and vendors and community organizations and moms, you know, how, what, I hear you saying to not coddle, to not, you know, just make this, you know, like these, uh, they can't do anything, to really bring out their strengths. What do you suggest? There's a tendency to overgeneralize about disability. Mm -hmm. I find that same problem when people ask me about dog behavior problems. They'll say something like, what do I do about my crazy dog? Well, I don't know. What do you do? Is he a happy, cute little thing that jumps on people? Or a big, nasty thing that ripped off somebody's leg? Maybe those both could be a crazy dog. Or they'll say, what do I do about autistic behavior in the classroom? I don't know. You know, I have to have a lot more information. Little kids that are not talking, I can give you a standard answer. But once they get a bit older, I've got to get some idea of what their level is. Right. Um, if I've got a third grader bored, that ought to be taking programming and advanced math in third grade, somebody needs to be giving it to them. Right. But I might have another child in there who's nonverbal with a, a uncontrollable epilepsy, mm -hmm. with very severe intellectual impairments, who's definitely not going to work for a tech company. Right. You so know, it's you, meeting the individual. Yes. And you've got to see what they can do. And uh, we need to be teaching a variety of different ways to teach math, a variety of different ways to teach reading. Mm -hmm. Because when I was in third grade, uh, the, the whole word, Dick and Jane books, did not work for me, but phonics did. And there'll be huh. another kid where phonics is horrible. Right. And then on the new math, I mean, in Kentucky, you've got third grade teacher getting in trouble for um, teaching borrowing and subtraction. Right. That's ridiculous. That right. was two weeks ago. Yeah. So what you're saying is, and, and I completely agree with you, that there is a brilliance in in this population that there's actual you know you're talking about some of the greats and and some people are putting that energy and how do we as you know community members and supporters bring that out and draw that out so like you say that they're not bored so that those strengths come out i just read a, bi a biography on thomas edison mm -hmm. i'm sure he's on the spectrum mm -hmm. but again work ethic learned really young Delivering right. newspapers at a very young age, telegraph operator at 14, and uh, exposed to all of the technical things early. Right. 
and then instilling their strengths and complementing that strengths and giving them the well, confidence. Well, his high school teacher said he was hyperactive and addled. Wow. Yep, and that was uh, Thomas Edison's uh, diagnosis. So mom uh, homeschooled him in a, in a house full of books. He was out doing all kinds of me mechanical things, almost got killed in a grain elevator in a grain pile. Oh my um, gosh. I was really lucky that did not happen. Yeah. But the thing that I'm finding with a lot of kids that are different on, su on success, early exposure to the thing that becomes their work and learning to work hard at work ethic right. from an early age. Well, and then I think that's addressing the exact thing that we were talking about, about this sense of entitlement and that life is easy. It, mm -hmm. Life takes life is hard work. And it was hard work. And I have parents say to me, what motivated me in my 20s to do those dip fat projects that are shown in the movie, which they showed absolutely beautifully. I wanted to prove to the world I was not stupid. That was a very, very big motivator uh -huh. for me. I wanted to prove I could do it. Okay, so you wanted to say to those naysayers, no, I've got a brilliant mind and I'm going to well, show you. Well, I'm going to show you how well I can do things. And I remember drawing the drawings for one of those projects for the Red River Feed Yard in 1978. And I got done with the drawing and go, wow, I can't even believe I did this. Wow. I guess I'm not stupid. No, you've tapped your inner brilliance. And the little thing I loved about the movie is my real drawings are in that movie. Oh, whoa. Oh, interesting. And we'll talk more about yeah. that. But speaking of work out in the community, I want to just real quickly take a little bit of a break and show a video. Our participants at Abilities United have taken a TV production class and they filmed a video, interviewed, did the shooting and everything on the magical bridge in Palo Alto. Let's have a look at their production. So the idea originally came because I have a daughter, Ava, and she wasn't able to use any of the parks here in Palo Alto. And you know Dawn is a real go-getter in this community, so she said, we can do it. You and I are going to build a park for Ava and all the children like Ava. It ended up taking longer than we thought it would take in the beginning, but it took us about six years to create this wonderful playground. So I really enjoy the enthusiasm and the joy that I see on the children's faces when we say, we're going to the Magical Bridge. We feel that all playgrounds should be like the Magical Bridge, designed and built for children and families of all abilities. We are so thrilled at Milestones Preschool and at Abilities United to have Magical Bridge Playground here. It's a perfect community setting where our kids in Milestones can really help meet a lot of their developmental goals, play, gross motor, social skills, turn taking, you name it. And it's fun. I get to be my mommy and daddy my whole family because I like all the structures. How fun is the playground for you? It's very, very, very fun. We had an artist from San Francisco create these stepping sounds. So as you come through here, it changes with different natural sounds like walking through snow, walking through leaves. The equipment are developmentally appropriate for each child and all the different uh, Equipment, too, is just a great way for the children to explore and have good uh, gross, and, gross and fine motor skills. Differences disappear, and you start to play with children and parents, uh, and you don't notice how they're different from you, but you notice what makes them similar to you. You can have fun in a playground designed for everybody. Is the playground good for all ages? Yeah, for all the people in all ages. Or do need more magical visions? because we have had hundreds, really hundreds of communities around the world asking us for playgrounds like Magical Bridge, we are forming a new group and going to be doing exactly that. Seeing this park be completed and watching both young and old people enjoy the thrill of being able to participate in play that otherwise they would never be able to do is why we did all of this. This park is all about magic and everyone feeling welcome and being kind to each other. And it's wonderful to see our participants in their videos. You know, Dr. Grandin, we started a TV production class years ago and I really believed that our participants could do it. And by this program, they were editing, they were writing the questions, they were getting the interviews. I didn't have to do anything. And they had developed these skills. 
And some of the strengths that had come from within them were just were magnificent to see. Well, the thing I get asked all the time was how to get my business started. Uh -huh. And one of the ways I did that was showing a portfolio of projects to people. I was real awkward in interviews. It started out with sign painting. So I had pictures of my signs and plastic pages, and I'd put them out and show them to people. Wow. And then I got some pictures of my livestock things. And then when I sold my biggest client of all, that was Cargill, I have designed the front end of every beef plant in North America. The way I sold that job was I sent a packet of information to Bill Fielding, the chairman, back in the late 80s. He had a big fold-out drawing, mm -hmm. very nice professionally made brochure I had made, uh -huh. no four-color printing, too expensive in those days. Uh, plastic pages with some photos, a cover letter, references, and some articles from a cattle magazine. I call it the 30-second wow. You don't put too much junk in it. You just open it up, and he went, wow. wow. And it has to be neatly presented. Right. And that's how I sold Cargill. And I wasn't able to meet with him. I just sent it to him. Oh, my gosh. Uh, the mistake that people make with their portfolios is they put too much junk in them. Mm -hmm. You want the 30-second wow. Mm -hmm. And you've got to put the right stuff in there for the right client. Because when I was younger, I wanted to sell a military base on some of my sign painting. And I put in stuff I did my aunt's uh, third grade classroom that did not fly with the military guy. You've got <laughs> to put the right stuff in the portfolio for the right customer. Right. And again, what you're going back to is you're talking about that belief in the project, the belief in just doing it and having the courage. Put the work out there. But, yeah. and, and one of the things that helped me on that is I had some employers in the beginning that got me co cold calling. So also, I used to sell jobs to packing plants. I would just cold call them. I'd find out they were building a new plant. I'd say, engineering office, please. And then I knew to try to get his, his direct line extension. And I wasn't wow. afraid to cold call. Yeah. And I learned that from the Arizona cattle feeders. I found I could sell ads on the big agency accounts I wasn't even supposed to sell. And this was in my 20s. Wow. Because I learned how to cold call. Wow. Where did all this courage come from? What did... I had a boss that made me do it. <laughs> I remember it really well. He says, you get on that phone right now and you call up the, the magazine and you get an article about our feed yard project in there. Right. And I did it. And again, it was because you were at work and you were doing it and you were putting yourself in the community. I also had some bosses that explained to me when I did things wrong socially. Mm -hmm. And you don't yell and scream. What you have to do is explain what they did wrong. My very first job at the Swift plant in Arizona, I criticized some welding that looked like pigeon doo-doo. And Harley, the old engineer, pulled me into his office, and he didn't scream at me. He just explained to me that I had to apologize for that kind of talk. Yeah. And, and I said, you just have to explain to the person what to do. You've got to tell them what to do. Mm -hmm. It's just like little kids. You see, in the 50s, they used teachable moments. If I was in the store and I was touching too much merchandise, the clerks would say, you can only touch stuff you're going to buy. They didn't scream mm -hmm. no. They'd say, put it back. They'd you instruct only... you. They would give the instruction. That was the old-fashioned 50s way of upbringing. Because I worked with tons of talented designers and millwrights that I know were on the autism spectrum. Right. And then junior today is getting a handicap mentality. Right. This is the problem. Uh, the the uh, autism definition has gotten so broad. Also, they're not teaching social skills to little kids the same way it was taught in my generation. Mm -hmm. Which is an important factor for all of us. Yeah. It's, for everybody, we all feel awkward in situations. And the video game addiction, I'm hearing over and over again. He's 18, I can't get him out of the basement. He's 21, I can't get him out of the, um, out of the bedroom. They're ending up on Social Security playing video games instead of working in Silicon Valley. Right, yeah. Well, let's, we're almost at the end of our program here, so I want to just see if we've got a couple questions from the audience to just ask a couple of questions. So I believe that we had a question over here. Go ahead. Hi, Temple. OK. So about the movie that was made about you, um, how close was it to reality, and what do you think about it? I thought they did a great job with the movie. They showed how my visual thinking mind worked. That was excellent. They showed sensory problems, anxiety. They also showed my projects really accurately. They recreated my projects done with the original drawings. My drawings were in it. I liked the way it showed the work stuff. And that was your work, right? They yes. showed the work. Like there's a scene in the movie where there's a big drawing on a desk with a bunch of guys around it, and cattle are animated over the drawing. 
That's a copy of an actual one of my hand drawings that was used to build a real job. Wow. And did you actually go to the Academy Awards? Were, were you, I saw you in the audience. I was there at the, at the Emmys and at the uh, Golden Globes. It was very exciting. You know, who's going to win until they rip that paper open? Yeah. Wow. How exciting. That's an experience many don't get. Good. Okay. Does anybody else have a question? What's another question? Okay, over there. And I think maybe if you could stand when you ask a question. Is that Thank you for being here tonight, Dr. Grandin. I'm from the California State Council on Developmental Disabilities, and I'd like to hear from you what you see as the role of local and state government in helping support our young adults with autism and other disabilities in the way that you're speaking of. Well, one of the problems is the spectrum's very broad. And one of these guys should be going to Silicon Valley. Another one's going to have much more severe impairments, and that's not a reasonable goal. Um, I want to get rid of the service cliff that happens when they age out. Want, well, okay, we got kids in the pipeline now. Let's start training on the work skills in middle school. The minute they're legal of age, get them in the workforce so there is no service cliff. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, now we've got ones where they have jumped off the service cliff, we're going to have to work with them. But the kids that are in there now, let's learn those working skills mm -hmm. so we don't have a sudden transition where all of a sudden they're graduating from high school, they never worked. I've seen kids graduating from college super good with honors, and then they can't make it in the work world because they haven't learned work skills. Right. Like get up in the morning and you've got to be there. Right. Let's start teaching that at 11. You've got some dogs to walk for the next door neighbors, and at 6 o'clock in the morning, you've got to walk Mr. Jones' dog every single day. It's a job. Mm -hmm. That can be just set up in the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. And then where do you see the, the state and government coming in? What do you say, see that role as? Well, the thing that I'm finding, I'm 20 years in the construction industry. Mm -hmm. I would sell a job. Then I'd draw the drawings. Then I'd be on the job site supervising the construction. Then we start up that system and make it work. It's all about outcomes. I'll tell you stuff I don't want to see. A smart guy that should be working at Silicon Valley playing video games on Social Security. Then mm -hmm. you've got the family with a very severe kid that needs that Social Security check. Absolutely needs to have it. You see, right. the problem is we're overgeneralizing on a lot of these things. Right. And we're not doing enough build up the area of strength into something and become a career. Mm -hmm. Another big beef I've got with the educational establishment, and I'm going to say all around, is they'll spend a zillion dollars on sports, and then they say we have no funding for music. Well, music can become a career. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right, right. And talking about where these, you know, it's, it's exactly what you said of finding someone's, where their gifts, where their talents, and teaching them how to work, well, the actual skills. Well, the problem skills. is you've got some states where the only thing a kid's going to learn in high school is math, English, and sports. And if you take out all of the art, theater, music, dance, uh, woodworking, welding, uh, they're not getting exposed to enough stuff to even figure out what they might want to do for a career. I think it's a big problem. Skilled trades, there's a ton of jobs open right now. Right. Everybody's hiring. Right. So you really think that the, that the, you can, the individual can really find a sense and then gain a sense of self-esteem, have meaning in life, and that will come when the work ethic is developed and people learn when how I to was, hold I jobs. Got, I got thrown out of ninth grade in high school for fighting. And uh, because kids teased me, I chucked a book at a girl, I was kicked out of school for that. So my parents didn't have enough money to send me to special boarding school. And they got me working in the horse barn, cleaning stalls and taking care of the horses. Mm -hmm. uh, and I also learned how to do roofing at 16 at that school. This did not exactly delight my parents. <laughs> but I think the headmaster realized that I was learning how to work. And mm -hmm. it's only been in the last few years that I've realized just how important that was. I got self-esteem from the fact that I was responsible for the horse barn. I did not do the financials, uh, but I did everything else. I fed them, I put them in and out, I cleaned the stalls, I the horse kicked a hole in the side of the barn, I fixed it. Right. I was basically running the horse barn. But you got that inner sense yep. of, I can do something. That's right. I am useful, I'm productive, and I have something to and give. And I'm running this horse barn, and I'm doing a good job at it. Right. That was 15. Wow, that's a really important skill. And I think that this is, we need to be doing a lot more of this. Get the kid out there in the farmer's market, helping us set up the booths, 
and they need to start doing this way before 16, way before. Right. I right. wish paper routes existed because that was one of the best things that happened. And I have a book called Different Not Less, which is 14 old Asperger's, all most of them had paper routes in their kids, made it in the workplace. And where mm -hmm. the diagnosis was helpful was in their relationships. There's oh. some computer engineers where the uh, learning about autism can help them with their relationships. Right. But yeah. all of these individuals had learned working skills young. Right. And, and it's so much, I mean, we all need help with relationship skills, with work skills, all of that. It's not that much different. Well, than the thing about autism, you take out some social circuits and you get geek circuits. I think a brain can be more thinking or a brain can be so, so more social emotional. Now, mm -hmm. that's a continuum. You know, one is that considered a disability. Right. You know, there's some very rich people here in Silicon Valley that I'm sure are on the spectrum, and since they're living, I will not name them. <laughs> I'm only going to name the dead ones, <laughs> that, like the ones I saw at the museum. <laughs> right. So, Dr. Grandin, what would you say to inspire and encourage? If you could give just a, a few sentences of what, what you would say to people to encourage them. Well, that's almost too broad. Okay. Um, I think much more specific. Okay. Okay, give me something specific, more of a specific case, and I'll tell you what Okay, I'll do. so say you have a, a person that comes into an agency. Okay. And you just, in a real quick sentence, want to instill, help them get to work. I don't have any idea what their skills are. I don't right. know enough about them. Uh, where I might put them, can they read? Right. My reading test is USA Today. So you would go back and you would find where that individual's at and kind I gotta of. I've got to figure out where his level is. Right. Can he read USA Today? Right. Uh, there's a lot of jobs that are going to be very difficult if you don't, at least at that reading level. Can right. he do the sixth grade math? Add, subtract, multiply, divide. Um, where his interests are, uh, a big problem I'm running into, and I've mm -hmm. talked to case managers. I remember spending, I spent, I spent two lovely days at a case manager's house. We discussed a couple of her clients in detail, mm -hmm. and one of the gigantic problems is transportation to work. Yeah. You get out in rural areas, gigantic big problem. Yeah. Well, maybe so, a, co a co worker get out of the work. This was a good lady. She was not a drug addict. Um, she was a hard worker, but she couldn't get to work. It was just too far away for her to walk. Yeah. Well, and I think what you've really shown us tonight, Dr. Grandin, is that there's brilliance in working, there's brilliance in just doing a good day's work, there's esteem that comes from that. You go to the individual, you find their strengths, their talents, you don't just generalize. And well, we got to do something about the health stuff. Yeah. Because I, one of the reasons why people don't want to give up their SSI is they don't want to lose the health insurance. Right. Well, and I like the stuff going on now with the EpiPen. Yeah. If I wanted something for unethical behavior to talk about an ethics class, that EpiPen stuff would be it's, at the top of the list. Right. Well, I'm unfortunately getting the sign that we're at the end. This just went so quickly. And I think that we have learned so much from Dr. Grandin and her view of success and working hard. And, and what a gift. What a light you are in the world. And we thank you from Abilities United. And it's just wonderful to be a part. Thank you very much, Thank Dr. You for Harvard. That was great. Sorry.